Hey everyone, this is Ryan, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about occlusion. So at first, occlusion seems to be a simple enough concept, just teeth coming in contact with one another, but in actuality it's a bit more complex. So the best definition for occlusion is the dynamic relationship between teeth as the mandible goes through its functional movement. So this is a staple concept of occlusion, that the maxilla and maxillary teeth are not undergoing any motion whatsoever because they're fixed to the skull. However, the mandible is able to go through functional movement because of the muscles of mastication and the temporomandibular joint, or TMJ. So the muscle seen here is the insertion of the lateral pterygoid muscle, which is responsible for initiating opening of the mandible. And here in blue, is the temporomandibular joint, namely the articular condyle of the mandible. So this region would be the neck, and then this would be considered the head of the condyle. This is sort of the ball of the ball and socket joint. Right above we have a fluid-filled lower synovial cavity. We have a dense connective articular disc a fluid-filled upper synovial cavity, and then the mandibular or glenoid fossa at the base of the skull. And then the fossa extends downward and forward as the articular eminence. And all those components make up the temporomandibular joint. So once this was discovered that the mandible is doing all this motion, we had some, some smart people come up with a diagram that marks all the possible range of motion of the mandible. So this point B, I'll start here because this is sort of where the picture is, is depicting. This is sort of a natural open position. This would be if you opened your mouth and Try to stick your tongue at the roof of your mouth so that your mandible was as far back as it could go, or as far retruded as it could go. This is usually on average 20 to 25 millimeters for, for someone, this, this, this uh, range from, from A to B. This range from A to B is also referred to as centric relation. And that has to do not so much with the position of teeth and, and their contact or lack of contact. It has to do with this, this joint. And the condyle during this position is uh, sort of relaxed. It's sort of at home. And what that means is it's anterior and superior, as most superior and anterior as it can be in this joint. So this picture doesn't do the best job, but it, it would be sort of nestled, picture being nestled up in this, in this joint as much as it could possibly be. So that the mandible is as far back or retruded as it could possibly be. This from A to B is centric, is the result of centric relation. Now, if you start to go further down, what happens is the condylar head can't sit in this space any further. And what happens is it has to slide down the articular eminence so that it ends up maybe here as its maximum range. And so what happens is instead of getting a smooth line down, we get sort of this bump in the road as the condylar head moves down the articular eminence. So a good way to think of it is, let's just back up the colors here. So if this A was a centric relation, that had to do with simp simple rotational movement or hinge movement of this joint in the lower synovial cavity. Let me pick another color here. And this B to E 
would be extended opening, and that has to do with translational movement within this upper synovial cavity. So centric relation, we see the hinging motion of the joint, and extended opening, we see the sliding motion of the joint. We refer to this as ginglomo-arthrodial, that the TMJ joint is both hinge and sliding. And we can see that in these two uh, components of Basalt's diagram. So what else do we have here? This, if this is uh, when the mandible is most retruded, this would be representing when the mandible is most protruded. So this point here we can refer to as maximum opening, and this point up here we can refer to as maximum protrusion. Okay, and then we have some, comp some more complicated stuff going on up here. Um, well, let's go back to centric relation. And this point up here, this point A, I'm going to make green for a second. That's the second the teeth touch. So if you have your tongue at the roof of your mouth, <laughs> I'm trying to do it right now. So your mandible is fully retruded, and your teeth touch for the first time. It might be... Um, well, typically, it's either that oblique ridge on the on the first maxillary molar, or the mesial cusp of the first maxillary premolar, and then your teeth may touch there, and then they might slide until they're all touching as firm, as closely as they can be, and that's this little slide right here, that we call slide incentric, because we're we're still. Pot, we're still technically in central centric relation with the with the joint, and this point here used to be called central occlusion. Now it's called maximum intercuspation. And this little region here, this would be if you started to retrude, it, it started to protrude your jaw out. It would um, your your central mandibular incisors would contact the central maxillary incisors and you get this edge-to-edge -edge incisal uh, contact here and that's what that little divot is. Uh, now in purple this is resting position so that's when you're at physiological, re physiological rest and your mandible is hanging freely a little bit protruded from centric relation. This is just natural. And this little space between maximum intercuspation and resting is called um, the free freeway space. All right. And one other thing I just wanted to mention quickly, there's a sort of, I'm not gonna do this any justice, but maybe this region in here is referred to as the chewing loop. Um, it, it's sort of the motion of your mandible that's most natural for, for things like chewing and talking. You're not really going to be opening up this, this wide unless you're screaming for something that happened on the television or you're at the dentist office or something. You're probably otherwise going to stay in this region most likely. All right, I hope this video is helpful and look for part two as I will discuss the the frontal view of Passault's diagram as well as other more intricate concepts of occlusion. See you next time.